Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am once again joined by Colin Watt to speak about Celtic cult heroes. In part one of this podcast, Colin gave us his greatest cult 11 and this week we will be looking at mine. Colin, welcome back to speak about cult heroes. Thanks for having me back again, Paul. Now, before I go into my team, please remind the listeners, because there have been a few podcasts in between part one and this part, remind us of what your cult 11 was. Greatest Celtic cult 11. Okay, so my 11 was in goals, David Marshall. At right back, Jean Joe Perrier Dumby, the only man with two joint names. Great facts from the first podcast. At left back, Charlie McGrew. Uh, the two centre halves, we have Bobo Baldi and Darren O'Dea. At right midfield, Didier Agat, uh, joined on the left by Paddy McCourt. In the centre, we have Lugomir Maravchik and John Collins. And up front, we have Tony Watt and Harold Bratback. I'm not trying to compete with you. There's, there's certainly one member of my team who made it into your starting 11. And did you choose who would manage your cult 11? I went with Wim Jansen. Right, so here's my cult 11. Here we go. In goals, Peter Latchford. Now, Peter Latchford, for me, is a cult goalie for Celtic. Andy Lynch told me he was nicknamed the Womble. So for anybody who can't remember Peter Latchford playing, he did have that kind of look about him. However, in saying that, you know, he was an England underaged internationalist who signed for Celtic initially on loan. And he then enjoyed a fairly lengthy career at Celtic. People would maybe be surprised he was at the club for a total of 12 years and he was part of the 10 men won the league team which, you know, I think is quite a cult team, particularly, you know, around about the circumstances in which they won that in Billy McNeil's first season in charge and uh, another great cult hero was sent off that night in Johnny Doyle. So Peter Latchford, he came from a footballing family. His brother was Bob Latchford who played for Everton and England. He was a striker. And his other brother was Dave Latchford, who was also a goalkeeper who at one point played for Motherwell. So he came from a a footballing family, but Peter Latchford later on was a a coach, a goalkeeping coach at Celtic Park. And he's he's become a bit of a fan's favourite, which I think is part of the whole makeup of what makes a cult hero, is if they've got that Mm -hmm. relationship with the the fan base. And some of the honours that Peter Latchford won as well, as well as the 1979 league, he was part of the double winning side a couple of years before, which was the last great hurrah of Jock Steen, the double winning side. He played in that final uh, in which Andy Lynch scored the winning goal from a penalty kick and he did win three Scottish Cups including the Hamden Riot. In fact, he had the, his hands on the ball when the final whistle blew in that particular game. So Peter Latsford, I think, would probably be an interesting guest on a Celtic State of Mind. I believe he's been up at the Greenock CSC, Colin. He has. He's been one of our guest of honours for our sportsman's dinner. And to be fair to, to Peter, I think for my generation, what I remember him for and what some people about my age will remember him for is that he used to be the goalkeeper um, on the Masters football that was on Sky Sports um, when Celtic used to put in the, the team that played at Brayhead Arena. Um, against the likes of Rangers and Motherwell and Partick Thistle um, he tended to be the goalkeeper for Celtic um, it was between him and Barry John Corr um, that was the goalkeepers um, but again a, a very nice man and as you say he's he's played in some of the key moments in Celtic history that people maybe have forgotten that he was involved in mm-hmm. but uh, I, a good choice at, at goalkeeper and also Sky Sports if you're listening Get, get the Masters football on whilst we're stuck in here. This will give us something to watch. Aye, we reruns of that, absolutely. Now, Peter Latchford's in goals and he also had a dodgy moustache at one point. So, that, again, is one of the things that you could throw in the, the, in the fashion stakes for the cult hero. And talking of fashion stakes, the right back, I've chosen him at right back, is Rudy Vata. He was very adaptable, Rudy, and he could play centre half, he could play in midfield. He certainly was a midfielder international level. I remember him. Mm-hmm or Albania, captaining the side against Germany and playing an absolute blinder against Lothar Matthias. But uh, Rudy Vata, I've got to know Rudy over the years playing for the Celtic Greats and he does not accept anything that is below his standard. He will absolutely go through anybody on the pitch, no matter who you are and who you've played for or not, and destroy you if you're not trying hard enough or if you don't play the offside trap to his exacting standards. And I've, I've seen quivering wrecks in the 
in the changing room at half time, refusing to come out for the second half because Rudy <laughs> Vat has given him an absolute rollicking. Rudy, you still made out for the second half, Paul. I did, I did, and I went back, <laughs> I went back. But Rudy Vata, people all know that his son Rocco is um, showing some real promise at Celtic at the moment as well. Yep. But uh, he came, it was the circumstances in which he signed, which uh, first of all brought him to everybody's attention because he was a, he was a refugee, he was an asylum seeker, mm-hmm. and he was obviously fleeing Albania and he did that whilst he was playing for the Albanian national team and he was in France and he sought political asylum during a, a game where he, he basically ran up the tunnel grabbed his bag and uh, fled and you just think about sleeping rough and train stations and all that kind of thing just to try and and, and then afterwards going to the police station and saying you know I, I seek asylum and from there he eventually got his move over to, to Celtic I mean I, I asked him about being brought up in Albania and during these times and yeah, it was horrendous. It was absolutely horrendous. There was some crazy rules and, and laws in actual fact where you weren't allowed to wear jeans. You couldn't wear jeans. They were they were classed as too Western. And, you know, Simon Donnelly told the story that Rudy Vata used to cut his own hair in the changing room. He used to cut, <laughs> and by the way, we're, we're all doing that now, aren't we? Now that we're in isolation. Oh, but what what came from that was an incredible level of performance and standard in relation to his training regime and his philosophy. When you speak to him, you get that because he is he is very. We've obviously interviewed him before for a Celtic State of Mind, and we just kind of scratched the surface. There's a book in Rudy Vata, without a doubt. There's a book in that man's career, and I like him a lot, even though he rips me to death when I play for the Celtic Greats team. And he proved Tommy Burns wrong. Tommy Burns didn't rate him when he took over at Celtic and told him as much, but he turned Tommy round and he eventually won the 1995 Scottish Cup under Tommy Burns. So. Rudy's at, at right back, although I know he may not have been an obvious choice in that position, that's where I'm playing him. At left back, I have the one and only Anton Rogan. Now, if Brendan Rogers names his son after you, then you're certainly something. You've you've made an impression of some description, Colin. Anton- now, Colin, you do have to put allegedly there, because it's really hard to believe a lot of what comes out of Brendan Rogers' mouth. Well, interestingly enough, I spoke to Neil Cameron just the, the other day there, and you can you can have a listen to that podcast. It was quite insightful, I think, from Neil. And Neil said that uh, during his dealings with, with Brendan, he felt that Brendan Rogers was very charismatic, etc., as we all did. But he said you had to fact-check what he was telling you. He actually had to fact-check it, because you just never knew what was true and what wasn't true. And... Uh, mm-hmm. Anton Rogan, youth career was with St. Oliver Plunkett FC, so that's a good start. That's a good start for him. <laughs> and uh, and again, you know, he did suffer a, whole, a hell of a lot of abuse when he was playing international football. I don't think it was publicised as much back then. He was an internationalist with Northern Ireland, obviously. And when he played for Celtic, he took a lot of stick. And I think he comes into what I described as a second category of cult player, where it's someone who doesn't have the flair and maybe the natural talent of their Paddy McCourt, to use an example. But the application, the commitment, the determination makes him a, a fan's favourite. So Anton Rogan, I, I think back to him breaking his nose and playing on with a blood-covered top, breaking a wrist and playing with it all strapped up, missing the penalty against Aberdeen in the 1990 Scottish Cup final. But at least he took it, because some others didn't take a penalty that day. Yep. And definitely a cult hero. Definitely a cult hero. Who went on to play in an FA Cup final for Sunderland against Liverpool after he left Celtic. But there was a few players calling, I felt, that when Liam Brady came in and took over from Billy McNeil, he got rid of a few guys who I think he would have been better off keeping. And he would have got a few years out of them. And I think their careers after Celtic proved that. Rogan, Chris Morris, Derek White... People might be wincing at the sound of these guys' names. They, they three players were all international players. And what they were replaced with w- was guys who didn't do as good a job. Simple as that. They knew the club. We needed a bit of stability. And I felt that we were weakened by it selling on those three. And I know that Neely Mocken agreed, certainly with the Derek White transfer. Couldn't believe mm. that we allowed him to go. So, Anton Rogan, what's your memories of Anton yourself, Colin? Well, see, Anton left Celtic before I was even born. So it's, it's a bit of a hard one But having looked back at some of the, the footage from that era I, I, I see what you mean I mean, that is a, a, a very difficult time To be a Celtic supporter 
Um, and it was that during that era where there was a lot of players that who went on to then go and have great careers. Like so, um, I was just mentioning that Anton went down to to Sunderland, but you've got you've got guys like Paul Elliott and um, Andy Walker. It's a, it's a difficult period in Celtic's history, both on and off the park. So it's, it's hard to judge these players. Do you think if Anton had stayed and went through the that period and went through the transition and made it into like a Tommy Burns team that he'd have maybe not been a cult hero but more of a, a club legend? Well, I think if he had got maybe, as you say, the 10, 12 years under his belt, his career may well have been viewed differently. I mean, when Brady came in, uh, it's interesting, you mentioned Andy Walker there, people may not remember him as fondly as a player because of obviously there's, there seems to be this attitude to that we regard him as a pundit rather than thinking back to how he he played for the club, particularly mm. in his first spell. But he had a cracking career down at Bolt and Wanderers. You know, they had that great cup run, a couple of good cup runs. And Andy Walker was prolific down at Bolton. And we didn't get much money for Walker when he went down there. And, you know, we were bringing in, if you look at the strikers that uh, Liam Brady was bringing in, guys that didn't score goals, simply. You know, mm. they didn't score goals. And we were allowing a goal scorer, someone who was a proven goal scorer, to leave the club. So I think that the transfer dealings of Brady were obviously his undoing. And it escalated the issues that Celtic faced on a financial level as well because it was bad management. We brought in Stuart Slater for 1.5 and sold him for 750 grand. The business we were doing was dreadful back then. You know, We were bringing in players like Gary Gillespie who was so, so injury prone and we were spending a million pounds on him. Class player in his day, but he was never going to play a lot of games and he never did. You know, Tommy had a massive a massive job to do when he took over from McCarry. There was a lot of dead wood in that squad and it took him a while because he didn't have the money to invest, you know. But would uh, Rogan have done well under under Burns? Well, you know, some of the some of Burns' ex teammates found it difficult. I think Paul McStay and, and Peter Grant at times found it difficult playing under Tommy. Uh, they knew each other so well and there was that bond between the three of them. But then it's difficult if one of them becomes the boss. But yep. yeah, it's an interesting one. But uh, as well, I didn't mention Rogan being part of the centenary, the double winning side and... Uh, so your status straight away is there for evermore. So Anton Rogan, cult hero, absolutely. Might even make him a captain of this team. Now, <laughs> I'm just running 1-11. to 11. Number four, although I am playing him in the midfield, is Thomas Gravison. Thomas Gravison's my number four. And people might think, well, you know, he's, is he a cult hero? I think he's a cult player and has been a cult player at every single club he's been at you watch some of the footage of him playing for Real Madrid Colin and it's the old Luther Blissett uh, question did they sign the wrong player you know (laughs) when you see him playing for Real Madrid and of course Cy Ferry's made a career out of trying to extract stories about Thomas Gravison I read a I read a really good book last year by Chris Sweeney who came on and, and spoke about the book on A Celtic State of Mind, all about Tommy. What was missing from that book was uh, an interview with the man. Uh, I think the interview would be very interesting. He was he was clearly a very talented player, really, really fit and dedicated to his craft, but it sounded as though he just wouldn't do as he was told. My first memories of seeing Gavinson in a Celtic jersey um, was actually at Love Street when Celtic won I think they won 3-0 that day and Thomas Garrison got a hat-trick mm-hmm. and I'd managed to get tickets my friend from school um, his next door neighbour was the right back for St Mirren uh, David Barron um, and we managed to get tickets for the home end for that game uh, so that's the old Love Street I think that was maybe the season before they knocked that down um, so we were in the home end um, obviously couldn't wear any colours or that we had to to be to be smart but he had an absolutely outstanding game that day and I don't think it was long after he'd just signed from Real Madrid and even at Real Madrid he was still putting in sort of between 20 to 25 appearances a season so there was a good player there but I think Gravinson will probably be remembered for well, the stories that Cy Ferry's now telling us about how he, he loved to play pool or um, his performance away against Copenhagen where I don't think he touched the ball the whole game but he just kept chasing shadows. There was also the interview I did with Gordon Strachan and, and Strachan spoke of his frustrations with Gravison due to the fact that he would give him instructions, very succinct instructions and he simply wouldn't follow them. And, and he's talking about even just the area of the pitch that he wanted them to, to be in and he was running up and down wings and all this kind of stuff. And Kevin Graham, time and time again, brings up the performance against Man United where, where Gravison was the weak link and it was just down to him just doing whatever he wanted. So that that's a lack of discipline. Mm. Yeah, it's a lack of discipline if, if you're going against your gaffer's wishes. And it is unfortunate because he was one of those 
marquee signings that uh, Celtic don't make a marquee signing now. A marquee signing for me is someone who, you know, a Robbie Keane, Roy Keane, Janino, and and of course this man himself, Tommy Gravison. When you buy a player from Real Madrid or you buy someone uh, from one of the top English Premier League clubs or you, you bring in a player who's a Brazilian World Cup winner, that's a marquee signing. And uh, Gravison was part of that era where we would bring them, them in from time to time. I don't think we'll do that now because the game's changed so, so much, Colin. And now, mm. af- after the pandemic that we're currently facing, uh, there's even less likelihood that, that we'll do that. Although, speaking to David Lowe in a podcast that we put out last week, it is interesting that some of the financial experts are looking at this as a great leveller for football all across the globe. And, you know, whether or not it takes another generation for us to go back down the road of the gulf in finance between the smaller nations and the, and the larger leagues where where clubs are basically surviving on the TV revenue. And the big issue with that, obviously, is anything that unforeseen, like the times we are currently living in, comes around. Uh, clubs like Burnley, for example, are facing financial ruin. So, you know, I don't think we'll get the, the marquee signings. It was good fun while it lasted. I'm pretty sure all the, the forums and everything else uh, hit a peak when... I'm talking about forums. Remember them? They would have hit a peak <laughs> when players like that came in and um, Celtic view sales would have gone through the roof and all that kind of stuff. But it was fun while it lasted. Tommy Gravison wearing the number four shorts for me. Number five and at centre half is Johannes Shuggy Edvaldson. Edvaldson comes from an era, again, that would have been alien to you in terms of your point of reference, but you'll be aware of, of Shuggy. Shuggy, again, was a part of the, the ten-man winning the league team. Uh, they yep. played in the 4-2 game. Andy Lynch told me a lot about him. Andy had a lot of time for Shuggy Edvalds, and there's a couple of good anecdotes in his book. Why is he a cult hero? There, there's absolutely no doubt in his ability. He was uh, an Icelandic internationalist when he came in. He spent five years at the club. I think he was part of the, the 4-2 game. He was part of Billy McNeil's uh, first league winning season. And he was, at that time, quite unique in that he was an overseas player. And Celtic didn't tend to sign many players from overseas. I think uh, the reason for that during Jock Steen's time was he dipped his toe in the market a wee bit, Colin. Jock Steen, you know, he, he brought in the Brazilians in the 60s and he had also brought in a, a goalkeeper called Bent Martin who went on to have a career at Dunfermline. And there was no great successes. He brought in trialists. He brought in uh, Mordejai Spiegler, who was an Israeli internationalist, one of the greatest ever players that came out of Israel. So when you're bringing in guys that don't necessarily perform to the level of the Scottish boys you've got, which was the case at, under Jock's team for the best part, I can see why there would be a reluctance to bring anybody in from, from overseas. And it's interesting that Edvaldson signed in the season that uh, Sean Fallon was looking after the side, although I'm pretty sure Steen would have still had a, an active say in who came in and who went out during that time. So I've got mm-hmm. a big shuggy, and the very fact that I'm calling him shuggy, it means that uh, Celtic fans liked him enough to, to give him a nickname. So shuggy's at the back, and he's with another shuggy, uh, Darius Dovchek. Darius Dovchek, who was an absolute class player, uh, came from Legia Warsaw, as did Darius Jakinowski. And we also called Dovchek Shuggy, so we've got two Shuggies at the back. Have you, have you any memories? <laughs> have you any memories of the second Shuggy, or, or again was that before your time? Again, just before my time. Again, a wee bit before my time. Um, but what what we can touch on um, certainly is there seemed to be a sort of influx of players that came over from that area, the sort of Iceland, Denmark, kind of Finland. Um, especially at, um, at my local team at, at Morton, um, they they managed to bring over those sort of players as well, and that was sort of when they had the the most success. Um, was sort of that era, sort of late eighties, early nineties, um, where these players started to come over. But from memory, I don't really remember there being that much success for the, the sort of national teams of the likes of Iceland and that. I know Denmark went on to 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 do well, but. Um, so what, what was the what was the sort of encouragement for the likes of Celtic to dip into that market at that time? It would be difficult to, to answer that. I think it would all come down to, at that time, if there was any intermediary who was, who was doing the work between Scottish clubs and clubs from those nations. That's normally what you find. I mean, Celtic obviously do a lot of work with certain agents now. You get players from the same type of regions as a result of that, you know. And I know that the uh, Dembele's agent also works with Eduard and Encham. So it, it really depends on, on the agent 
and at, at, at that time agents weren't as prevalent, although you know perhaps overseas clubs and overseas players were represented more. And by the way, you're looking at these these particular countries. Certain nations do well in Scotland, so I don't think we've ever had a a, a Brazilian at Celtic who's done well. Although you look at some of the the more kind of Nordic players, and they they've always done well. The Scandinavians do well at Celtic. We've always done well with Polish players as well, Colin. You know, if you think yeah, about my- one of the biggest cults being Boric. Obviously, Shuggy, his countryman Jackie, whether or not he gets in my team, you'll find out soon enough. But Jackie and uh, Dovcek both played or were part of the 1990 World Cup squad for Poland. You know, Poland played England famously uh, Mm -hmm. in that tournament. And he was just a class, class player. And he was captain of Poland. And he was mentioned in one of Billy McNeil's books. And McNeil said that that Darius Dovcek was actually one of his biggest disappointments because he didn't feel that he actually had the career he could have had at Celtic. And that's an interesting one because the fans automatically think of Jackie, but you know Dovcek at centre half or at left back with that left foot of his, with the strike that he had, and I'm thinking about the St. Patrick's Day Massacre where he scored for about 30 yards with a free kick. Shuggy Dovcek was was a class-class player. Maybe he was at the club at the wrong time. You you could see him playing for a successful Celtic club and uh, he wouldn't be called a cult. He would, you know, it's like what you're saying with Rogan. He might have been uh, far more fondly regarded amongst the Celtic fan base. So I'm not saying he's been forgotten about, but he's not a name that would be obvious to like the likes of yourself, Colin, if you've maybe come a generation after me, almost. Mm. But uh, obviously he's went on to have a, a lengthy managerial career. And again, it would be maybe interesting someday to get Shuggy on the show and, and to chat about his time at, at Celtic, because again, this was a period where we really did start to ramp it up in terms of bringing in overseas players. You know, the two poles came in, and after that it became the norm that we could sign players from all over the place, and it's not stopped. So, Darius Dovjek, I'm playing him at centre-half. I know he was an excellent left-back, but there's no way I'm dropping Anton Rogan. We're moving into the realms of the kind of entertainers. I would say number seven is the one and only Paddy McCourt. Paddy McCourt is the epitome of a cult player in the green and white hoops of Celtic. I actually picture him when I think of Paddy. I picture him as a side-born 1970s Celtic player. I think I mentioned that before. I just, yep. you know, he was kind of out of time and... That comment from Neil Lennon that he was a, a 1970s throwback, I gave that to Paddy one day and he says, you know, you can see where it comes from. He was quite old-fashioned, Paddy. He was a dribbler. He was a guy who, you know, when teams play systems and they talk about risks and taking risks, and that, that was an interesting conversation I had with Alan Morrison on the Celtic by Numbers podcast, is talking about James Forrest's accuracy in, in relation to his passing. So people may see it as a boring or a predictable pass. But what he's doing is keeping possession, which is obviously a big thing for Brennan Rodgers when he was in charge. But Paddy would take risks. He would try and take people on. I remember as a fan, Colin, watching him. And when he came on, there was an air of expectancy when Paddy McCourt came onto the pitch, wasn't there? And, um, oh, most certainly. I don't think he scored a bad goal. I don't think he ever scored a bad goal for Celtic. No, and the, the bit about Paddy, which was quite interesting, especially when he signed, was he seemed to play um, in the reserves for what seemed to be about seven or eight months and you always kind of looked forward to seeing the reserve highlights through the week at this point I'm pretty sure Celtic still had Celtic TV through they used to be able to get it on either Virgin Box or Sky Box it was a, a standalone television channel um, and I remember always looking forward to watching the reserve games because Paddy McCourt would always be the guy that would get on the ball obviously he's playing at a level where the tempo wasn't as quick as first team football so it's sort of his, his lack of not not agility but sort of stamina um, wasn't as as clear cut as what you'd see when he made it onto the first team. But he always used to go on the ball. He'd, he'd make some incredible assists. He'd score some wonder goals. I think he scored a, an absolute cracker when he made his first team debut against Falkirk. And he's a player that will turn around and say to your grandchildren, "You want to have seen this player on his day." And they'll turn around and say, but he only made 80 odd appearances for Celtic. And you go, aye, but there was, there was never a bad appearance. They were always, they would always get yourself to the ground and watch Paddy McCourt play football. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I remember that game against Falkirk. Didn't Kokai Mizuno score that night as well? I think. Um, oh, what a throwback that is. It is, it is. And Paddy, again, I've mentioned this before, but his goal that he scored against St. Pauli was a real, it was a coming together of player and club I think because I think St. Pauli and Paddy were a great match and imagine him being a St. Pauli player they'd have built a statue of him you know what I mean he was he was an absolute genius on the football pitch 
And as you've already alluded to, I'm going to ask him to come and play for the Jimmy Johnson Select against St. Rocks. And hopefully he's able, because it would be unbelievable to see him again going on these Maisie runs. Paddy on a Maisie, there's no sight like it. See, it'll be interesting, just don't put him on the same side as Rudy Vata going on what you've said about Rudy. <laughs> <laughs> ah well you couldn't really argue with Paddy uh, to be fair I mean the guys that I've seen Rudy going through they had no ability whatsoever me included so that's fine but um, <laughs> when Celtic bring a guy over like Paddy McCourt I mean again like anybody else unless you've got a specific knowledge of the Irish game you're, you're really just relying on what you can find online aided by any kind of footage that was being shown at the reserves at that time but there's so many names that come over over the years I remember a guy coming over from Derry called Nigel Melly, right? Sounds like a Viz character, but he actually was a Celtic player back in the early 90s. And the guys just come and go, and, and Paddy could have been one of them. But as you see, every so often you would see a wee snippet and you thought, wow, this guy's a genius. It was just a real issue with getting that fitness up, Colin. And once he got the fitness and he started making first team appearances, people realised this guy was special, you know. And over the, the last couple of years, I've had the pleasure of speaking to Paddy on a number of occasions and he's such a lovely guy. So yeah, Paddy McCourt's in my team. Stan man, actually, in my cult 11. Moving on, number eight, I've gone for Massimo Donati. Now, I rated Massimo Donati really, really highly. I thought he was an excellent player. I think he showed a wee bit of that uh, when Tony Mowbray took over, in actual fact. And when he started playing well, we sold him. Such was our kind of policy at that time, I, I think. Remember the left back, we had Danny Fox. Remember Danny Fox? Yep. We brought him in and, and very quickly sold him because... If we could make a profit or, or turn a profit on a player, we seemed prepared to do that. He came in and as far as I know, or at one point or at the time we signed him, Donati was the most capped Italian under 21 level, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, he, had, he had had a massive move from Atalanta to Milan for over £10 million pounds, and he came with a, a really big reputation. Although he had had various loan spells in Italy before he came to Celtic. You look at the Italians that, that we've had, over the years and we've had the likes of Paolo Di Canio Enrico Anoni and then Donati comes along and he's a class act as a player he had a wee bit of the uh, left field attitude with the you know the hair getting dyed and all that you remember that he had the Mohican oh, and all this kind of stuff totally bleach blonde and then he went bleach blonde but as a player I, I, I thought he was a classy classy player but he didn't play enough games unfortunately under Gordon Strachan and um, oh, he's obviously back in Scotland now. He's he's part of the setup at Kilmarnock, and he's another guy that's played in the Celtic Greats games. And he was <laughs> unbelievable because I mean he played in 2018 for Saint Mirren, and then he played in 2018 for the bounce match at a junior football park against us. <laughs> you know, so he's he's a player that really gets Celtic as well, um, and you, you start to see that with some players when they come in. Um, and I think there's probably a couple of players that currently play for Celtic um, that will probably make it into the future. Cult Hero 11s, if we have this discussion, sort of 10 years from now. Um, there's players over the last two or three years that you'll probably see make that 11 as well. Um, but he's got a Celtic tattoo on his chest. Um, he's, so, he's someone that really got the club. Um, and I'll always remember him for scoring the goal against Shakhtar. Um, that was... That was one of the best nights at Celtic Park I've had putting this crew into the, the last 16 of the Champions League. Last minute goal, mm -hmm. incredible scenes. And a guy, as you say, when he's been on and played for other teams, has always been someone you looked out to to see how he was getting on because he was a great player when he, he played for Celtic and nobody had any ill feelings towards him when he left the club. I think when someone leaves you with those moments as well, Colin, it's one of the things that... that obviously contributes to his status as a, as a cult player because you, you, are, you do have the fond memories. I mean, was he a better player than, say, someone like uh, Jiri Jarizic, who was at Celtic uh, during a, a similar period, who came in on big money from Chelsea and uh, Czech Republic internationalist? I, I don't really think back fondly on him, you know, and it's no nothing personal against the guy, but th there's a certain bond or affinity that you have with certain players and that's why Donati's in the team and again he speaks fondly about Celtic if he wasn't attached to a club I'd be trying to get him on the podcast for a chat as well you've already mentioned my number nine and that was in relation to talking about his countryman Shuggy Jackie Jackanoski I remember him signing and he had the old playboy looks he was a, a season ticket uh, holder at Victoria's nightclub with Paul Elliott by all accounts <laughs> He liked a he liked a body. Probably wasn't he the best trainer in the world, from what I've been told. But 
what a player on his day, but those days were were few and far between, unfortunately. Jack Anoski, there was the name, there was the nickname, there was the playboy. We, we love a playboy at Celtic, or we did back then. We had Charlie Nicholas, we had Mark Aveni, and we, we, you know, people with, of that ilk. And then Jack Anoski comes along and you think, well, he might be the 90s version. There was also the thing with Jackie that uh, we wanted a hero at that time because of the Mo Johnson saga and we'd been, you know, really let down by Johnson. We brought in Jack Anoski, but I don't think he was the same standard of player, to be honest, as much as he's a cult player. He's obviously come back from time to time. He's come back as a, a guest in some of the some of the bounce games, the charity events. And uh, mm-hmm. what I remember when he went down there, you always follow players' careers. He went down to Bristol and his career was very similar down there. Flashes of brilliance bit of a cult hero. There's a great video of him scoring a wonder goal on YouTube for Bristol City. And he had that in his locker. He'll always be remembered for scoring against Rangers with his knee, I think it hit his shin, something like that. Off the post, hit him, went in. He scored the four goals against uh, Partizan Belgrade, against uh, a team managed by Ivan Golak, who at one point was touted to be Celtic's manager when Brady took the job. I actually think Golak was interviewed, ended up at Dundee United. And they had Gordon Petrick at centre-half. And Stefan Skepovic, his dad, played that night as well, Colin, for uh, Partizan Belgrade. But obviously, I mean, it was an incredible game. He scored four goals. We won 5-4 and we went out on away goals after a 6-6 draw. But when you talk to the players who played that night, they were frustrated with Jack Anoski. They were they were actually frustrated. Even though he scored four, there was a couple of occasions where he could have he could have laid on for someone else to score a goal and he didn't do it. There was an occasion in the League Cup final, 1990, one-on-one, extra time, bottled it. And of course, the Scottish Cup final, the one that uh, Anton Rogan got a ribbon for for some time. Jack Anoski never took a penalty. So, cult hero, because he ticks a lot of the cult hero boxes, but he probably should have been a better player call. It's, it's an interesting one, as you say. I mean, when we looked at the criteria for the, the cult hero in the last podcast, we're kind of looking at the sort of three criteria, and one of them was a guy with ability, but only to a certain level, but always gave his all in the park, mm-hmm. or a guy with talent that wasted it. And I, I think Jackie probably falls into sort of both of those categories, because if you look at his career before he came to Celtic, he was a bit of a prolific goal scorer in Poland. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's, he was kind of one and two for Legia Warsaw before we signed him. But when he kind of came to Celtic, he's, it became more one and five, one and six. And if you take those four goals away against Partizan, his, his record's not great at all. Um, and his record when he moved on from there wasn't great either. So the, the sort of, as if he had a sort of peak in his career, when he was he was young, unlike the way, the way a natural footballer progresses, where they get to sort of twenty eight, twenty nine, and that's their, their peak careers. I think Jackie certainly had his a lot earlier into his career. Yeah, and again, it was the dark old days of no trophies as well. So you know, these days are not looked back on fondly. Uh, they they just remind me not the view and and uh, being utterly depressed with the the way the club was going at the time. His partner up front is someone who is pretty close to your own hometown, Andy Ritchie. Yes, before we get into Andy, we just want to wish him all the all the best. He's unfortunately um, contracted the, the virus that's gone round at the moment. I uh, haven't heard many updates over the last uh, week or so, but I believe he's, he's getting back to full health, so it would be good to see him back at Capelo and uh, maybe on the podcast one day to tell his stories. But yeah. He's a, he's a legend around this this neck of the woods. Morton fans could, could fill a, a whole 12-hour podcast with, with stories about Andy Ritchie and scoring from the halfway line and free kicks against this this team and that team. and um, Certainly a, a very, very talented player, but he just didn't seem to, to to make it at Celtic. And I think it was more his lifestyle than his, his, um, his ability. Was that, would that be about right? Well, I think so. I mean, Andy Ritchie, the idol, idol, well-named, and uh, what a player, an absolute genius on the football park. I think I look at him and think, well, what he did at Morton, it's such a shame that we didn't see more of that at Celtic Park. Obviously, came through the youth ranks at Celtic, alongside players such as uh, Brian McLaughlin, the, the first Brian McLaughlin super, and... Everybody I've ever spoken to, be that a young player around about that time or one of the older guys who were dropping back into the reserves for any reason, spoke so highly about Andy Ritchie and his ability. I think around about that time, Colin, people need to realise that uh, a massive part of Jock's team's success at Celtic was the training regime. It was so you know geared towards, yes, he did introduce a ball in 1965 famously because there wasn't much ball work before he arrived. 
But in terms of the actual physical fitness, and nearly Mockham was a massive part of this, that team was supremely fit. I mean, they ran Inter Milan into the ground in Lisbon in 67. Yep, and, definitely. you know, Celtic have always been famous for scoring last-minute goals. There's no, there's no coincidence in relation to that, you know, if you were to look at the stats. And it's because of the that there's a wee bit more in the tank, as well as the quality, of course, but there is more in the tank. And uh, Celtic, Celtic's training regime probably didn't suit Andy. I remember speaking to Mike Jackson, former Celt, uh, best friend of the late great Billy McNeil, who later on was part of the management team uh, with Benny Rooney at, at Capolo. And he spoke about Andy, didn't he want to run at training, quite happy having a smoke and all that kind of stuff. So it's unfortunate that these guys, though, you know, a Morton legend, but I think he played his last game for Morton aged 27, 28. Yep. And then there were sporadic appearances and he was out the game before he had attained the age of 30. And that is always, that's always a bit of a travesty when a player with so much talent, perhaps, did he fulfil it? Would he be happy with his career looking back? He achieved a lot more than others. Again, it would be great maybe to talk to Andy Ritchie and as you say, all the best in his recovery from this terrible virus. Yeah. And I think it was, it was probably best put by Chick Young, um, not that long ago, I'm sure I heard him say that Richie was the epitome of a Scottish footballer. He was a fat, lazy bastard, but he was brilliant on the ball. And that, that sort of sums Richie's career up. And you're right, he did, he retired um, around about the age of 29 or something. So, as I was just mentioning, players getting into their peak. Well, Andy Richie had that years beforehand. Um, and just one, one part of that was when Morton um, actually got Richie it was an exchange deal for the goalkeeper Roy Baines um, and a fun fact about uh, Jock Steen's period at Celtic is that the one position that he signed most players for was actually goalkeeper I think he signed something like 13 goalkeepers um, and Roy Baines is just one and that starts the whole Andy Ritchie story With regards to Andy Andy came back he came back as a scout under Tommy Burns as well so he did come back to the club and yeah I hope he gets well soon the other player that I've chosen who will be wearing the number 11 shorts is Quality Street Kid Paul Wilson. Now Paul Wilson I've always found him an intriguing guy an intriguing character and I had the pleasure of speaking to him when I was writing the book on the Quality Street Gang and he very sadly passed away at uh, the age of just 66. Paul Wilson was regarded by many of his peers as being one of the most naturally talented players in that group. And when you look at his career, 12 years at Celtic, you know, there were periods where he wasn't a regular. I think his vintage season was 74-75, where he scored in three cup finals, and he got a call-up for Scotland. And he was a mixed race, first mixed race player to be to be capped by Scotland. And that that is something that, that is um, relevant because due to his mixed race, he was he was terribly abused racially in Scottish football. It's something that um, is part of Scottish football's shame. Looking back at the the racial abuse of Paul Wilson back in the nineteen seventies, but in terms of his ability, he showed obviously that season seventy four seventy five, which is Wilson's uh, definitely his vintage season, what he could do. Uh, but again, he was he was coming at a team that was full of Lisbon Lions and Quality Street kids. And uh, anybody that had a, the career that Paul had obviously had something. And when I look at him as well, though, he just had that look, didn't he? He had the movie star good looks, the big yeah. long sideburns, the dark hair, flowing locks, all that kind of stuff. He was a, he was a great player, and I think he was one of my first choices in my, my, cult, my cult icons. I couldn't pick a team without picking a quality street kid, could I? I mean, it would go against everything that you've done in your whole career, but I, I mean... Paul Wilson, it's a tragic story, Paul. Again, someone that retired very young, um, had his peak probably sort of in his early 20s, um, scoring the, the 29 goals in that 74-75 season, um, outscoring Kenny Daglish. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the fact that he never got more caps for Scotland um, says a lot uh, about the selection period back then. It is, it's, a, it's a real shame about his career retiring, like, as I said, at 29, but with, with what happened, and if you lose your kind of enjoyment in football, then it's, it's probably the only way to go. He had a niggling ankle injury as well, and uh, there was changes when, when Billy McNeil came in 
and uh, it was obviously under McNeil that, that Wilson left. Jockstein certainly never shipped him out like many others, and uh, Steen was kind of viewed as a as a father figure. Paul Wilson lost his parents at a fairly young age, and uh, Steen had a, a real affection for Paul Wilson, who admitted that he enjoyed a wee cigarette up at the back of the bus when they were travelling to games. So that's my cult loving team now completed. Talking about managers, the manager for me, I'm going to go for Frank Connor, who was never defeated as the manager of a Celtic football team. Absolutely incredible start that, um, although it was only four games. And he played sport in Lisbon and Rangers in that period, because the Rangers game was apparently Lou McCarry's first game in charge, but uh, Lou McCarry uh, kind of took a, a sideward step and allowed Frank Connor to, to obviously pick the side and uh, give the team talk that day. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Frank Connor the, the cult hero manager status for my cult side. I mean, there was, it was a, a hard period for, to come in and take over as well, but um, I think looking back on that period as well, I'm surprised that Liam Brady got as long as what he got in charge. Obviously, Frank Connor was there as, his, as part of his backroom team, and when the likes of um, Brady and Jordan left, and he took over, it, <laughs> It's, his um, his record is it's unbelievable. Beating Sport in Lisbon, beating Rangers. I can't really complain with him being the, the cult. And again, it's a, a player that never had much of a, a footballing career. I think he made a couple of appearances for Celtic in the early 60s. But it's obviously someone that has the club very close in the heart. He certainly does. One final word on Frank Connor when I met him. He was a, he was a, he was a real Celt, as you say. He played for the club briefly in the early 60s. And he knew, he knew Neely Mocking as a player, as a trainer, as a kit man and as a friend. And he spoke very highly of him. He obviously came back and was the assistant manager uh, of Celtic under Davy Hay. And he was sacked. He was actually sacked in 1986 unceremoniously, but thankfully he came back to spend some more time at Celtic. And he, he was a real old school taskmaster at Celtic Park. And the young guys all speak very highly of Frank Connor and his methods as well. So I hope Frank is doing well. Uh, the last time I spoke to him was uh, at the Nearly Mocking launch night back in 2015. So there we have my own Cult Celtic team, Colin. Join us next week for Axom's Cult Celtic 11. Thank you for joining us again, Colin. I'll speak to you soon. Take care, Paul. 